You are listening to Reinvented. I'm your host, Jen Eckhart. If you're a fan of this show and have been following along since its inception, you might have heard me share that I'm a huge fan of the 90s alternative rock era. Some people say never meet your heroes in life, but I say invite them on your podcast. I've interviewed lots of public figures and celebs over the years, and I always tell myself the same thing. Jen, just be cool. Just play it cool. Don't be a fangirl. Don't be that weird girl. But... I'm afraid I have to let my fan freak girl flag fly for just a second because someone is on the show today who I've considered not just a hero-like figure to me, but has someone who's quite literally played a central role in shaping the culture of the 1990s. And to this day is selling out arenas nationwide on his Spirits on Fire tour. William Patrick Corgan is a two-time Grammy award-winning frontman of... I think one of the most influential bands of all time, the Smashing Pumpkins, having sold 30 million albums worldwide. Billy Corgan, welcome to Reinvented, my friend. Thank you, Jen. Can I call you friend? I feel like like we're friends. We've gotten to know each other a little bit over the last month after our mutual pal Chris Jericho introed us. I don't have many friends, but I would consider you a friend. <laughs> oh, I'm honored for the title. Keep your Keep your circle small, I guess they say. What is the saying? Uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Love your enemies. So you're yep. not quite an enemy yet, but you're in the friend oh, zone. Oh, thank. Not yet. I'm in the friend zone. I'll listen. I'll take it, Billy. I wanted to have you on the podcast, not just because I'm a huge fan of your music. I mean, that's obvious, but because to me, you personify everything this podcast stands for. You exemplify what it means to constantly reinvent yourself as a person, as an artist. How have you stayed motivated over the years to keep creating and reinventing? Well, I think it starts with a spiritual precept. Um, if you believe in a material God, which many people do, then ambition, i.e. achieving the most of your career, uh, which can be a dirty word in alternative music, well, that would be the thing. You want to sell the most tickets. You want to sell the most records. You want to be on the most magazine covers, get the most clicks. If you believe in a spiritual perspective or a spiritual God, which is what I operate from, then your purpose is slightly different. Your purpose is more predicated on the idea of why you serve your own journey, which of course uh, um, uh, has a material construct within it. Why you serve your own journey, are you serving God? Are you serving God's purpose for you or is your purpose of God? As someone once told me, your purpose is God's purpose. There is no um, delineation point. If you serve your purpose, you are serving God's purpose. So I believe I'm serving God's purpose by trying to find some sort of strange balance between my own spiritual and, uh, personal, uh, progress, um, juxtaposed a vapid, hollow, shallow, and increasingly cold world as Mm. far as it pertains to the individual right of a human being trying to balance all those things. And so my progress in quotations, my reinvention to use the parlance of your podcast has everything to do with believing that my progress as a human being has everything to do with my progress as an artist, has everything to do with my progress as a spiritual devotee of Christ. That's very convoluted for most people to understand. So I'll keep it really simple. And I don't mean this to be pedantic because sometimes people get lost in the spiritual component. I just want to be a really good person. And uh, I think being a good artist is being a good person and being a good person should make you a good artist. Being a uh, plasticine uh, rock star, pop star, uh, there's plenty of those. And it, it never uh, cease, ceases to shock me how people want to turn me into something, A, that I'm not, but B, also something which there's already plenty of stock of on the shelves. Uh, they're certainly prettier than I am. Uh, their voices oh, are nicer stop. than I am. <laughs> no, but I'm, what I'm saying is it's very strange to be successful as an outlier. And then when you come up against the system of, of, of man, and I say that pejoratively, um, they want to change you into something that you're not. Yet totally. the reason you're at the dance is because of your outlier status. So somehow in there is a, is a, is a consistent philosophy for reinvention. You know, for those who don't know, you did just touch on your faith. You are a Christian. I don't think a lot of 
people, particularly those in the media, question you about your faith. And that's why I sort of think of you as this unicorn in Hollywood and that, you know, you don't usually hear of church going rock stars who also threw LSD parties back in the 90s. At what point in your life, Billy, did you realize that your faith had to be a top priority in your life? As far as the media and my faith, I mean, I think the media just looks for things to poke at you about. And I think for whatever reason, they just have not been able to poke at me about my faith because I don't think there's anything to poke. Um, My faith believes in everyone. Uh, I believe every soul is equal. Um, I don't believe in a supreme God. I believe in one God that unifies us all. Um, And I'm not even opposed or even have any kind of grumpy feelings about people who believe other things other than I do. I don't believe God uh, as I believe in God is petty. And it wouldn't surprise me if God set up a hundred thousand religions to draw everyone into the center of what is the very simple argument, which is love is the supreme force in the universe. Uh, I've certainly been blessed by love, um, particularly now in my life with my family. I walked away from the church when I was eight years old. Um, I used to go with my stepmother, who was a Roman Catholic, and go sit through those endless uh, Latin masses which were kind of cool in a sort of Wagnerian way. But outside of that, I was bored out of my mind. And I would just sit there and look at Jesus on the cross and say, I'm not sure how this works out where this is a good thing that he ends up on the cross. That took me a while to sort of sort that thing out. Um, I didn't really come back to God probably until my late 20s, early 30s, when I hit a a point of spiritual crisis. I was suicidal. Uh, I was wildly successful at a very young age. And I didn't know what to do with myself because I was miserable. Um, I was in a terrible relationship. Uh, you know, we all know what that feels like. And, um, and I found the one thing that wouldn't abandon me, which was God in sort of very loose quotations, like what is God and how do I fit into this picture? Wow. And thus began a very long spiritual journey, which I realize now started in my childhood, but I didn't know that's what it was. So when I had those quiet moments, uh, you know, I, I had a very abusive home. So when I had those uh, quiet moments in a forest preserve, listening to the rustling leaves and the, and the wind through the trees and feeling something greater than myself, I didn't realize I was in touch with God. I just thought I was having a little moment, um, which of course I couldn't share with anybody because I assumed that nobody around me was having that moment. Um, but it, it started to quantify into something concrete in, the, in the late 20, my late 20s, early 30s. Then I went down a very, very uh, heady path of uh, spiritualists, occultists, astrologers, psychics, uh, which I still love. I don't have any uh, anything negative to say. Um, that became part of my journey. And then eventually around, uh, around itself around into something um, which I would say most uh, is aligned with Gnostic Christi- Christianity. Um, and uh, again, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm funny in this particular way. Like if you believe in, a, in a, I like to say avatar, which is a little bit more impersonal way to say a, a deity or... Um, you know, Christ-like figure, whatever you believe in, um, I'm cool with it. I, I, it doesn't surprise me in any way that God would litter the world with, with people to follow that would point you, hey, go this direction, go this direction, right. go this direction. I see, I see Jesus Christ as a supreme teacher. And um, as somebody who wants always to be a student, I don't know why you wouldn't go sit yourself at the feet of someone, um, whether it be Buddha or, or, or Jesus or... Um, Gandhi even, you know, where you, we can learn something about uh, yeah. love and uh, compassion. Well, listen, as a rock star reaching the status, the fame status that you're at, I do think it's very rare that you are outspoken about your faith and that you are unapologetically Christian. I think that's very rare in today's society. So kudos to you, my friend. Well, I won't swear on your podcast, so I'll say it Kindly, oh, we can I just, swear. We welcome swearing. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to swear. I'm trying to, I have my own podcast now. Uh, there's a plug. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I try not to swear on my own podcast. And when I do, I get mad at myself. So I, <laughs> so to answer what you just said, uh, I don't give a hoot what people think. It's, it's really strange. It, you know, um, there's the defiant version. There's the defiant teen version of, you know, crossing your arms. I don't care. And then there's the adult version, which is, I just don't really care. I don't really care what people think as far as my spirituality goes. I think spirituality is you know, there's certainly through the years, uh, whether it's Dark Night of the Soul or other, you know, enlightened texts, there's a sensual aspect to divinity. Um, and I think uh, talking about your spirituality in open terms is like talking about your sexuality in open terms. This is, 
There's a yeah. sort of very personal nature. And I just don't think it's my business what anybody does in their bedroom uh, any Fair. less than they really have any business what goes on between me and God in my head yeah, or, or heart. I love that. You know, you did mention your podcast. I've always said on this show, you know, reinvention is the key to living a truly fulfilling and authentic life. A comfort zone is a nice place. You know, it's a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows from there. And speaking of stepping out of comfort zones, for those who don't know, he just said it, Billy is not just a two-time Grammy award-winning rock star, but he's now a fellow podcast host like me. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there has a microphone and a podcast show, it feels like. All the cool kids are doing it. What took you so long? I was recruited <laughs> by someone in the, in the podcasting, I guess, agent world a few years ago who said, Hey, I think you can really do this. I said, no, I don't really want to do it. And then a year later, they kind of cycled back and said, are you sure? And I thought well, there might be something there for me as far as how to market. I sell a lot of my own records these days. I've sort of created my own media, I guess you could call it. Um, I'm very comfortable with selling my own music and selling myself through my own channels, um, as opposed to always going begging through somebody else's gatekeeping. I love that to quantify or qualify what my value that. is as an artist, which is really weird because after 34 years, you think you would have graduated, but here I am in front of some reporter who's still basically telling me, you know, what, what I've done hasn't amounted to a, a hill of beans to use the old term. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting to me to be able to use the media of podcasting to tell your own story, Yes, which is like, which is what I like about what you're doing. I think it's, um, I think it's important that everybody have a seat at the table as far as a voice and, if podcasting is a way to sort of create your own media by which to share your own vision of the world, I, I have no problem with that. Yeah. It's, and I have to say, just having been a national TV journalist at the, at a corporate network, not having the corporate overlords breathe down your neck and tell you who you can and cannot interview and which questions you can't, you have to steer away from has also been really nice for me. Well, let me go a step further than you on that regard. Um, what's even more interesting, and both of us have been behind the wizard's curtain at the highest levels of media. A lot of times they don't have to tell you what you can and can't say. You just know. Oh, yeah. Oh. The lines are sort of implied. Wait, we're right? not going to talk about Donald Trump? I thought that was like the whole basis <laughs> for this podcast episode. <laughs> no, I love it because, you know, um, you know, and you see it a lot more so in governmental systems. People don't need to get a, a memo telling them, hey, look, this is how it goes. They right. just know. They put their finger in the wind and they can feel. I could talk about this. I can't talk about that. And I'm sure you've had plenty of private conversations as I have with figures in the media behind the scenes where they tell you what they really think oh, and, totally. what they, and what 100%. they really know. Yeah. There was that shocking bit of video not a few years ago. I think it was an ABC News anchor who was on camera, but they were in a commercial break and she spilled the beans about knowing something super yep. intense yep. and the tape and somebody leaked the tape and it was a total, you know what show, because there was a candid moment from someone at the highest levels of media, basically admitting that. Uh, I think it was ABC or somebody had squashed a story. Yeah, the, I think it was the, Amy Robach. Yeah, on and, ABC. The, and the anchor and I, was very angry. It was about angry. Jeffrey Epstein, I think. That's right. And the anchor was very angry because they had a hot story, yeah. which was, in essence, a pursuit of the truth. Yeah. And the network was like, nah, we're just not going to run that. Yeah. Don't you love how that happens? Hmm. Interesting how that works. The name of your podcast, which is amazing, by the way, it's called 33, which is an ode to Billy's brand new three act rock opera, rock opera. That's something I haven't heard before. Say, Album say, called, that, say that three times. In the yeah. Month. Rock, rock opera, rock opera, rock opera. There you go. It's called Autumn, which is set to be fully released in April of 2023. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Billy, I think you're one of the first ever musical artists, at least that I know of, who is like slowly trickling out songs from your new album one by one via your new podcast, which is so brilliant to me. What inspired your decision to do that? Well, one, I'm pretty in the modern world. So dumping 33 songs on anybody's head um, and expecting them to pay any attention when their phone's going off every five seconds is a, is a recipe for disaster. So I thought a longer arc on, a, on revealing the music, a little bit of mystery in the thing. And of course, telling the story behind the rock opera would be kind of uh, cool. It would kind of work that way. Secondarily, uh, I was in business with some people um, who I'm not in business with currently who just thought the entire thing was a terrible idea. The 33 song uh, musical, the podcast that would go with, they just thought it was all just a terrible idea. In essence, just stick to what you do well, which is a 10 song rock and roll album. And I kept saying, look, uh, so be I, a I think sheep. My, be a well, sheep. I think, 
Yeah, in the music industry. <laughs> I, yes, I think my quote. At, uh, I think my quote in one of those meetings was, "I knew it was a bad idea when I started." Um, and this, I think, let's speak to the spiritual heart because I think it's more interesting for you, for your audience. At least I think so. Um, you know, just because something seems like a bad idea to everyone else doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Absolutely. Um, I, when I started the band, people told me it was a bad idea. When I came with the name, the Smashing Pumpkins, people told me it's a bad idea. People told me we could never make it out of Chicago. I mean, I got a thousand of those stories. I, so does everybody else, right? Listening to everybody else's opinion is sort of, it has a value, but it doesn't really sort of speak. If you know some, you're on a particular path, well, the, the path on this was, I want to release this big body of work. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not 25 anymore. I don't know how many more of these I have left in me. Making one of these is like making a major movie for me. It's like, it takes a long time. It was yeah. two years of work and four years in conception. Wow. And so, um, so yeah, so it's like a, you know, bad poker analogy. You know, you just put all your chips in. It's like, it is what it is. Yeah. You bet on yourself and I think it paid off. Imagine making one of the biggest uh, double albums of all time. One of the biggest albums of all time. An album that gone, went diamond. I think only 26 or 27 albums have ever gone diamond. Melancholy is one of them. That was a double record concept record of over two hours of music. So here I am 20, you know, 28 years later, whatever. And I have somebody in the boardroom tell me this is a terrible idea. And I'm like, that's what they said back then. Right. When I, when I was young and, and I had in fact, everything to lose, I yeah. bet on myself and my band and we, and we, and we won. So it's this weird stuff, but that's just, that's the inside baseball of just how the world operates. Doubt first, uh, trust later after you've proven something. I love that. I had an executive over at my former workplace tell me, you just, you don't know how to use a microphone. You don't know how to use a microphone. So here I am on a microphone <clears throat> hosting my own podcast, but I truly think that well, what does it, sorry, doing interview, what does that mean? You don't know how to use I, You know, microphone? standing, doing a stand up and, you know, interviewing people. Like I wasn't holding the microphone the correct way. You know, I, 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 so I've decided like lovingly I think, or is, this, I, is, is there an art to this? <laughs> He's got to stroke the microphone. I think I'm going to ship him a box of microphones for spite just to, just because I can. What do you think? <laughs> well, I would, I would, this might be overly uh, stating the case, but I, I think symbolically here, you, you know, if you kiss, if you kiss every microphone, so every microphone has your lip prints on it. Right. Yeah. You know, so it so sends a double message. Okay. Oh, I like that. I like that too. <laughs> Well, listen, I think the 33 album is a genius, genius idea. And what I love about your podcast concept, Billy, is that it not only gives fans something to look forward to, but you tell the story behind the song and even share the meaning and inspiration behind other classic songs of yours. I am curious, though, like what happens when 33 podcast episodes are completed? Is that the end of the podcast? Well, um, I don't know. I'm toying with the idea of becoming a professional podcaster. Um, <laughs> that, that seems so strange. You add that to your resume? Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of things that I never talk about publicly because the people who talk to me in public aren't interested in those things with me. Um, mm. I'm very interested in history, and I'm certainly interested in the history of music. There's a lot of incredibly significant musical artists that get no love from the modern world because some hipster critic decided they're not valuable. Yeah. But musicians... If you talk to musicians, musicians have a very different perspective of who's valuable in the music community. And I'm talking historically. Um, you know, for example, and I'm just you know, off the top of my head, you know, uh, you know, people will name Czech Louis Armstrong as one of the first musical geniuses of the 21st century. That, that, that accolade was late in coming, but it's sort of an established thing now. He's probably the first true musical genius of the 21st century and launched you know, what we would now know as jazz yeah. in you know, circa 1928. Well, you know, um, and, and I'm, I'm probably getting my history wrong, but, you know, he worked for a guy named King Oliver. Um, and I'm, if I'm wrong, sorry, sorry, whoever is a jazz aficionado, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he worked for a guy named King Oliver. So, you know, you could make an argument that King Oliver is almost as important as Louis Armstrong because King, uh, King Oliver set the stage for Louis Armstrong and was part of what was, became progressive music coming out of New Orleans. So a deep dive on King Oliver would be interesting to me, you know, but actually getting like a music historian on talking about those types of things uh, with it, with the perspective that somebody who has an hour on a workout or something would walk away and think, I really want to listen to King Oliver now. I think that would be like something I would be interested in turning people on to things in a deeper dive way. So whether or not there's a business model there, we'll, we'll find out. It, oh, I can I always love... talk about myself, <laughs> but, but, but that, but that is a, that is a fungible, uh, 
Oh, thing. come on. People love Billy well, Corgan. Well, I have 400 songs. So we, 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 we once we get to 400 podcasts, we're out of songs. So. Yeah, I was going to say, do you make a 44 song album next then and release 44 podcasts? You could just no. keep this trend going. No, no. The, uh, no concept albums for a while. I, I need a break. <laughs> you know, your latest single, which is such a banger, by the way, it is my anthem right now. It's called Beguiled. If it's okay with you, I want to play a little bit of your song for my viewers and listeners. So swallow high the serpents of many tags and faces in endless all around the stone and the music video of this awesome song. It was filmed live on TikTok in one take, which is just wild to me. Billy, what was that experience like? Well, remember it was live, live to TikTok. So the one take was the take. There wasn't like we did a take <laughs> and then we picked the best take. No do-overs. Um, it was wild because we'd hired this guy to kind of help and then he didn't really do what he'd been hired to do. So with about two weeks to go before the video, I was like, we got to pull this thing. It's just not going to work. And then our dear friend, Linda Strawberry, stepped in and kind of pulled it together sort of halfway. Linda Strawberry? And her last name Strawberry. No, her real name is Roberry. Um, oh. I named her Strawberry years ago uh, on stage <laughs> at the Pumpkins Last Concert, December 2nd, 2000 in Chicago. And, and she's now legally, I believe, Linda Strawberry. Oh, wow. Um, is a dear friend of mine from Salt Lake. Anyway, so Linda stepped in. If you see the new Pumpkins tour, Linda did a lot of the visuals behind the band. Um, Linda stepped in and kind of pulled it half together. But when I arrived to the set that day, I think about five hours before the shoot itself, imagine I've got like a bunch of ballerinas, my kids in costume. Uh, Frank Catalan, who's a famous saxophone player, plays with Jimmy, uh, jazz with Jimmy. I've got this whole, uh, I've got the mayor of Highland Park's husband uh, dressed as Abe Lincoln. <laughs> And everyone's just kind of standing there looking at me like, what are we going to do? <laughs> so I sort of jumped into wrestling mode and said, okay, you go first and I go here and you do this. And over the next four hours of a lot of screaming and um, asking people <laughs> okay. to kindly move Pure this chaos. way or that way, we literally, we got to the point where um, we got, we were like, okay, we can kind of do what became the video. Um, it is what it is. It's little rascals. Make it up as you go along. Okay, go. And then we're standing there. And then somebody calls and goes, we've lost the internet connection. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we had Wi-Fi. We were in a building in Highland Park, uh, which is where I live in Illinois. And then suddenly there was no Wi-Fi. So we're like, we have literally a cast of 100 people all standing in costume, sweating. <laughs> Abe Lincoln. And, uh, and Abe Lincoln just standing there in the dinosaur beard. costume. <laughs> you know, and you hear people going, oh, oh my God, this, this, this is the first time this happened all day. What are we going to do? Uh. So um, somehow it all just kind of worked and it became kind of a cool thing um, because, you know, back in the day, we used to get these massive budgets for videos, you know, yeah. $250,000, $450,000. Well, you don't have that kind of money in the music business for videos, at least not in our world. So um, I think I've kind of gone back to our, our rebel route, which is just have, a, have fun making a video. And the fun, I think, will translate where maybe you lack in, uh, you know, movie star, uh, need for speed production type thing. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's, it's probably the most fun video we've made in a while. 
I love it. It's so creative. What a genius idea. You know, Billy, you shared something on your podcast show recently in conversation with platinum recording artist Willow Smith. You guys were discussing the pressures that young artists face. You said, quote, the more you succeeded, the more people tried to put you in a box. I'm very much wired the same way. I mean, I learned early on in my career that some people will only like you if you fit inside of their box. And I always say, don't be afraid to shove that box up their ass. (laughs) But people identify with you because you are sort of an outlier, a misfit, an anti-conformist. You know, you make being a weirdo chic. And I mean that with the utmost respect, by the way. How have you managed to become such a success story while staying true to yourself all of these years? This may be an odd way to answer the question, but I think I accepted failure. Love that. If you game the system and you try to succeed all the time, you're going to have to compromise some part of your integrity. I'm okay with uh, integrity questions when you're sort of, excuse me, I'm okay with integrity questions when you're sort of near the top of the mountain. You know what I mean? It's like Indiana Jones, pile of gold for some sand. Compromise at the lower levels will just get you marginalized and uh, you'll give up all your leverage and your power. Um, For the sake of conversation, think of it this way. Um, Let's say anything you want to do. I want to be a writer. I want to be a successful ad copy uh, person. I want to be a successful musician and actor. Think of it as a building, and in that building is what you want to get at. You know, the money, the the access, the stage, the um, the promotion. Right. And outside the building are tens of thousands of people trying to get in the building. What is it about you that makes them in the building let you in that building? Getting in the building just starts a whole other process. But what lets them even get you in the building? You have to have something of value. If you don't value yourself from the first when you step into the building, let me tell you, you're not going to get anywhere. Once you get in that building, you have to believe that what you have has value to them. If it's a commercial exchange, we'll know what you're worth when you're walking through the door. Now, don't be surprised when they treat you like absolute dirt when you come through the door, because why? Well, there were 10,000 people standing outside and you're just one of 10,000. Right. That's the music business. Um, I mean, I could tell you that straight up. That's the music business. You're, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing. You're lucky to be here. Yeah. You're, you're lucky we're exploiting you. You're lucky. You're lucky. It's like, explain that to me one more time. Hey, when we punch you in the head, you're lucky. Okay, punch me in the head again. <laughs> so you have to know your value. And then once you're in the system, in, in my poor analogy, once you're in the building where the stuff is, the money, the in resources, the, arena, the access, in the, arena. the stage, the arena, right? You're in the arena of the thing. Okay, now begins this other thing where it's like it's a negotiation between the gold that you have in your pocket and the gold they wave in front of your face. Mm. And let me tell you, if you're in the building, they wouldn't let you in the building unless you had something that they wanted to exploit. But they will tell you everything upside down and left and right to tell you that what you have in your pocket has no value at all. Mm. It's basically, you know, pimp ho, you know, you need me to go out in the street to prostitute yourself. And if it wasn't for me, well, you wouldn't be safe on the street. And, uh, and I don't mean to make light of that, uh, that situation either, because that's obviously a horrible thing to be in. So, yeah, you know, you just have to constantly sort of ask yourself, who am I and what am I doing here? And over and over again, I've had to confirm for myself that failure was okay because the failure, the willingness to fail is the thing that they prey upon. Let me say that again, um, because it sounds strange coming out of my mouth. They assume that the minute you're in a, in the building, you're a sociopath. Okay. That you will do anything. You will sleep with anyone. You will do anything to get ahead. You will do anything to get ahead. They assume that coming in. So they're shocked that not only will you not do anything to get ahead, but you're willing to fail. That is mind blowing to them because a sociopathic personality wouldn't want to fail because right. that would push them right outside the building. Right. So I've been in the building. I've been thrown out of the building. I've crawled back up the building. You know, I've been <laughs> shot off the building. And over and over again, I, I end up back in a boardroom with people who want whatever I have in my pocket. I love Whether that. it's the Smashing Pumpkins or a new song or my ability to talk or my ability even to do a voiceover of all things. I mean, at some point, people come to me and they want something. And I've had to sort of establish my own value. And part of that is a willingness to fail because... It, 
I don't know if I'm saying it well because it's to me it's no, such an important. No, you're making perfect sense. I, okay, I'm good. following. To me, it's such an important point. Uh, people say, "When did you become a good songwriter?" I said, "When I started writing bad songs." Okay. Let me explain that one more time. I'm, you know, 23 years old and I'm writing a song. I start writing the song. I think this song's terrible. I never finished the song. I go to the next song. This song is terrible. I never finished the song. Now I'm gun shy. Yeah. Because every song that comes out of me is terrible. Just the act of finishing a bad song set the table for me to write good songs. Because I then I learned how to commit. And I learned that a bad song can turn into a good song and a good song can turn into a bad song. I allowed exchanges to happen at the subterranean level of my consciousness as opposed to predisposing myself to think, well, if I finish this song, the world's not going to like it, so I'm going to fail, so not, why would I finish the song? And da, da, da. That's the exchange that goes on through any kind of creative endeavor. I think the importance of failure in one's career is really lost in today's society. I appreciate you drilling down on the importance of knowing defeat. I think that's so important. What was I? I saw something online the other day. It was Barbara Corcoran, the founder of the Corcoran Group, big time real estate queen of New York. Uh, she's a shark on CNBC Shark Tank. She posted a video where she was playing cards with her son and her mom came over and said, you're not letting him win, are you? And she goes, no, 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 no. And of course she was letting him win. She was playing cards with her little son and she was, you know, she had an ace on the bottom of the deck. And in that moment, she goes, no, no. She goes, you're, you're letting him win. You're not teaching him anything. You need to teach him how to lose so that he can appreciate when, you know, those moments when he wins. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of resonated with the message you were putting the journey. out there. Let me say it from a slightly different spiritual perspective. The journey should be hard. Yeah. It should be hard. Yeah. There are those rare um, people who through talent or a generational fixation seem to be the right person at the right time. And it looks really, really easy for them. And right. maybe it is and maybe it isn't because I didn't get that card. <laughs> I didn't get oh, that card at the bottom well, of the deck. Neither did I. <laughs> okay. God bless. Right. So, um, if you can humbly come in and accept that the journey should be hard, that what you're trying to do is quite magical. Yeah. If you're trying to connect, uh, and I, obviously I'm in the frame of, of, of artist here. If you're trying to connect your individual spirit vision to the commerce of the world, I mean, just on the pure math, seven, eight billion people. If you can win that lotto game, I mean, you've done something, but it mm. should be hard. It's not like, it's not like it should be easy. Yeah. When I was young and talented, which I was, I expected people to go, hey, you, and pick me out of a lineup and make it, make it all easy for me and you know, put me in a limo somewhere. That was not the process. And it, I, I don't think it is the process probably with almost any uh, endeavor that it involves a lot of capital. So if you want to reinvent yourself, um, which many people do, um, and I think we live in a cool world now where you can see where people pivot mid midlife and go on to do other successful things. Or parlay the one success thing that they've done is something sort of with more depth and, and width to it. Like you just don't have to be one thing anymore. Right. Um, and I think that's important. So, you know, starting over, like, you know, me hosting a podcast. I mean, I've never hosted a podcast before. I've been interviewed a thousand times. So I, I get on a microphone. And I think, well, I can host a podcast. No, I can't. I've never you would think you've been doing this a million years, though, by the way. I mean, it really is a fantastic show. Well, that's the Irish in me. So that's just the Blarney. <laughs> the, Blarney, the Blarney passes for uh, authoritative skill. I like that. You know, what you were saying about how going through life unscathed, you know, it's actually really uninteresting. I always make a joke on this podcast with my guests like, hey, you're not allowed on this podcast unless you have massively failed at something or unless you've fallen down on your face and have gotten back up, picked yourself up again. I love the quote that reads, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in an, in an attractive and well-preserved body, but rather skid in sideways, chocolate in one hand, wine in the other, body thoroughly used up, totally worn out, screaming, woohoo, what a ride. I love that. That's not the goth version of the end of the life story, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just, I'll nod my head with uh, that what one. Would the go the, what would the goth version glass, be? You lost me a glass of wine. But, glass uh, of wine? Okay. <laughs> well, what would, what, would, what would Billy Corgan be holding in his hands when he slides into the grave? That's a great question. You know what? I've never been asked that. People ask me weird questions like, uh, what do you want to be remembered for when you die? 
Um, and I, I always refuse to answer the question because I'm very superstitious, but I do like this question. Um, if it was my choice, how I'm going, I think I just want to be holding a picture of my kids. I think that's what I don't I think I'd, I don't think I'd want for anything else. I love that. Wow. You know, a lot of people out there, I'm assuming in the media, they don't ask you about your kids. And I know that you, you take a lot of pride in them. You have a son and you have a daughter. Uh, how do you balance being a traveling rock star on tour currently and being a dad? Well, I did have the benefit. My father was a musician and some of my favorite memories as a kid is my father would take me with him to rehearsals, to sound checks. And I was bored out of my mind because I didn't know what I was watching. But the ambience, the, the camaraderie of a band, uh, the horrible smell of a bar at 4 p.m., you know, this, back, in, back in the 70s, cigarettes and beer and whatever else was on the floor. That stuck with me. You know, I mean, in essence, my father took me into, the, into the, his life in a three dimensional way, which included drug deals, but that's a, for another that's podcast for another day. <laughs> uh, I was involved in some drug deals too as a kid. Um, no, I think uh, what we try to do is we include our children um, and we expect our children to participate in our, our life, not as equals, but as children. Mm. So when we have an event at our tea house, well, the kids have to go. And if they don't like it, well, they can sit in the other room and watch, um, you know, Netflix or something, but they have to be there. They hear the people on the other side of the wall cheering for a comedian or laughing at one of dad's dad jokes, right? We want them in the, in the three-dimensional space of our lives. And so my kids don't blanch at coming on stage in front of 10,000 people. They were just on stage the other night, literally in front of 10,000 people dancing. Um, they don't blanch at... Um, Anything from a private jet flight to a commercial flight where they have to sit and coach because mom's got to try to get home for some business appointment. And the only flight she can get back is some, you know, uh, you know, three seats in coach and she jumps on and they're, they're in the back. So they, they live, they live multiple lives. And, you know, so one day they're the kids of a rock star and the next they're just like everybody else, just like I grew up going, you know, standing in the wrong line, you know, being mad about being in the wrong line, you know, yeah. The, we try to give them every experience of life and, and not sugarcoat what they're seeing. I love that. And also, and also try to help them understand because they have a very unique perspective being um, growing up in a wealthy family. Um, try to help them really, really understand that their empathy is vital to them having an important life. So our, our work with uh, an animal charity called Paws Chicago, a no-kill shelter, uh, for example, my children uh, just were there when uh, 50 plus animals came back from Naples, where uh, the, the, the center down there, uh, because of the hurricane, uh, was shut down, had no power. Paws drove a van down there, drove 50 animals back up to, for rescue. And my kids were part of the receiving uh, committee. I saw the video. It was amazing. Paws Chicago. But see, that's what I'm saying. It's like they don't just get to play rock star kids. They have to be granular. They have Absolutely. to be there. They have to be part of the Paws community. They right. can go on the charity drives. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were on the street somewhere on the North Shore of, of Chicago asking people for donations. They're not identifying as Billy Corgan's kids. They're just two kids on the street saying, hey, mister, will you donate to this charity? Something that they care about. So all that granularity is really important. And look, I don't have a, a, a magic uh, eight ball here. I don't know how they're going to feel when they're 15. I only know how they feel now. And, and I see their level of engagement. And, um, and I think that's, that's the key is just keep them engaged in what's happening. Don't let them live kind of a, a, a paper mache version of, of life because you want to protect them from all the bad stuff. I love that. Such an important parenting lesson there. You know, you did mention Paws Chicago. Over 50 pets arrived safely from Florida that was affected by Hurricane Ian. There is a new member of your family. You have a really cute puppy. Can you share the puppy's name? Colette, uh, the French bulldog. Um, my Frenchie? children went. The French bulldog. She's the yeah. cutest dog I've ever seen, by the way. Ever. Oh my God. Well, first of all, I haven't met the dog yet. As we're, as we're cutting this podcast, uh, somehow I have a dog that I didn't meet yet. Um, <laughs> but, the, but they went, uh, uh, the story was the mother. Um, and I'm, this, I'm waiting out of my depth here, but apparently uh, French bulldogs cannot have um, babies naturally. They have to have to be born by cesarean. Yes, I did. So the mother. That. So the mother was found in an alley, basically dying. So I thought that that was true for English bulldogs, but that also applies to French bulldogs. That's what I was told. So again, wow. uh, now we'll have the jazz people on me and the French bulldog <laughs> people on me with misinformation. We'll probably get a, a fact checked here. Um, 
my understanding is that is the mother was found in alley whatever the situation she was not able to give birth and so she got an emergency cesarean which not only saved her life but saved the life of the puppies and so as my kids were leaving pause after being part of the receiving committee they looked into some room and they said what is that and there are these little three little eight week old french bulldogs and so colette came home quote unquote as a foster uh, and it was about yeah, three days. Yeah, you knew that started, wasn't going to stay a foster. <laughs> I, got, I got I got a barrage of, of photos, like 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 hundreds of like here's the dog sleeping, here's the dog little, playing, here's the dog staring dog into guys. space. <laughs> so I have Come not met your heartstrings, Colette. and now you have a new member of the family. Well, we have um, in our home we have five, four, five rescue pets. Wow! So we're quite Incredible. the family. We have a uh, an elder dog, which is not a rescue. Um, that's Ling Ling. Her sister just passed away, um, about 12 years old, a chocolate lab, uh, and with some Sharpay. And then we have um, three rescue cats and now the dog. Wow. You have a full zoo there. I love it. Well, and two monsters for children. Um, <laughs> well, Pause Chicago is great. For my viewers and listeners, if you could donate, volunteer, or make plans to adopt, please do so, giving them a little plug there. You know, Billy, I truly believe that you are the people, you become the people you surround yourself with. I believe that you are the books you read, the films you watch, the music you listen to. Bands like your band, The Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Alice in Change, The Cure, Stone Temple Pilots, and Pearl Jam, those bands, especially yours, have played a significant role in shaping me into the woman and person that I am today. I know you get asked a lot who your musical influencers are, but I am curious to know, is there a particular experience that maybe your everyday fans might not know about that's played a significant role in shaping your music and your life up to this point. The thing that sticks out most in my mind was my father was a musician and he was very unhappy with his musical life and very opinionated. So it was that weird contrast of someone who was failing um, as a public musician by privately having a very um, deep perspective about music and why he loved the music he loves. So I was being taught internally as a child on how to listen to music, how to discern music from someone who had real talent and and a great ear by having to listen to constantly about how the business, at least the one he existed in, in the sixties and the seventies, you know, had basically effed him. Um, so it was a weird contrast because I love music so much, but I was always dissuaded from going into music. So I think that probably had a major influence and, and, and sort of let's call it the chip on my shoulder that I wasn't going to, um, you know, if I was going to be successful in music, I was going to have to do it on my own terms because I didn't want to end up like my father. So I think that probably had the most pervasive image, uh, influence on uh, how I went about my musical life. But I am a natural contrary and I'm very suspicious as my father was of authority. Anybody who, who sort of anoints themselves as the, sort of the, the, the possessor of the knowledge is always worthy of a red flag in our world. So somewhere in there, I guess, has some influence on, on how it all started. But yeah, musically, it's hard because, you know, I can sit here and name off a bunch of, of, of artists, but I don't think it really gets to the heart of the matter because my father, I think, gave me the key to how to listen to music, which is, which is like what we talked about before. If I ever did a like, podcast, like, I think it'd be really interesting to talk to people about how I was taught how to listen to music because I think most people don't know how to listen to music. Because most of their experiences with music are cultural, they're environmental. They put on a song when they need to chill, make love. They're in the car. They're having a bad day. They want to have a good cry. Um, most people don't have the the knowledge base to know how to take music apart intellectually and put it back together in a way that gives them a deeper appreciation, particularly for pop music. Wow, yeah. I guess we're going to have to tune into your podcast for you to teach us how to listen. Shh, to music. Another plug. We got to do like a bell or something every time there's a plug. <laughs> Ring the bell every time the I plug, mentioned the 33. Plug, the plug bell. You did mention your father and the influence he had on you. You know, you, like me, Billy, are no stranger to the world of addiction, having lost many loved ones to it. I pray my viewers and listeners never experience the lows of addiction and the ugly depths it can take you to in life. You're pretty outspoken about having grown up in an abusive family. 
you know, you've shared that your late father was a former heroin addict. Your band also suffered an unimaginable personal tragedy in 1996 when your keyboardist overdosed on heroin in a New York City hotel room and passed away. While the Smashing Pumpkins has sort of had this on and off again type of relationship over the years, would you say that your experience in witnessing addiction and the toll it takes on lives played a crucial role in the compassion you have towards others and why the band ultimately came back together again? Yeah. Wow. That's a loaded question there. Um, let's start with compassion. When you're standing there in 1996 in New York, you have two sold out shows at Madison square garden waiting for you. And your band is just blown to smithereens because of, um, drug addiction. Um, you know, not a lot of compassion in your heart right about then. Looking back, yeah, I have tons of compassion, particularly for the for the family of the deceased uh, uh, in that situation, Mr. Melvoin, because it was just a total tragedy. Um, drug addiction is probably one of the most pernicious things in the world because, uh, yes, there are biological factors that play into um, what goes on. Not everybody takes the same drug and has the immediate same reaction or need to fulfill a field of whatever void is being filled at that moment. Um, there's certainly there's environmental factors when you're in a band, you know, there's pressure on you to kind of party, you know, like you got to sort of like everybody around you wants to enjoy and you become part of the party. And if they can party with you, they become part of the band or some crap like that. Um, but on the other hand, there's a level of narcissism involved with drug addiction, which says this drug is more important than whatever we've built, whether it's a relationship, a family, or, or a band. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I've influenced, uh, sorry, it's hard for me to talk about. I've experienced drug addiction, not in myself, thankfully, but I've experienced it at the, at the most intense levels with family, uh, lovers, and, and band. Uh, I've had the triumvirate of the experience. And um, there's no easy answer there. There's no easy answer because if you love somebody, you want to, you know, you kind of convince yourself you're willing to ride to hell with them. And it literally is a hell ride. You go down to hell with them, wherever they're at, that addiction will take you there. So it's hard sometimes to separate the drug from the person. Um, and at some point you do have to assign responsibility. Let's remember a drug addict uh, by definition, chooses to do that drug over and over and over and over and over again, or relapse and do it again and again and again. Right. So, uh, in trying to get to a, the heart of the question here, I found the way to get across this particular bridge is to is to love the person at all costs, while at the same time holding them accountable for their decision making. It's a really tough path to hoe, but it's the only one I've ever found across the bridge. Um, let's, let's talk about my father. My father's deceased now. Um, he just, he died at 74. He just wore his, his body out probably with at least over 30 years of addiction, if not more. Um, he probably would have lived a lot longer. I think if he didn't have uh, an addictive past, he was sober when he was dying, but that made no difference. It was kind of the story was over. Um, so using my father as an example, um, my father was willing to let his children starve. My father was willing to let his children go without, you know, uh, shoes, clothes, holes in shoes, all the, all the classic Dickensian stories. Uh, my father was willing to let us be evicted out of places because he chose his addiction over his, his family. Um, my father stole money from me because of his addiction. Um, I mean, I could go on for an hour about the stories involving my father and over and over again, people in my life would say, how can you support your father? How can you still talk to your father? How can you have any relationship at all with your father? And I said, well, I love my father. It was very hard needle to thread to continue to love my father while at the same time saying, I still have to hold him accountable for his choices. He doesn't get a free pass because he's an addict. He gets a free pass because I love him. Yes. And that, and that balance is the hardest to achieve, but that's the only redeemable balance in the relationship. Otherwise, there is no redeeming aspect to being in a relationship with an addict. You will go down with them. So only love back to God one more time. Only God 
or love or the understanding of Christ-like empathy, not sympathy, empathy, can get you to a place where you can both love, honor, and cherish the person who is destroying themselves in front of your, your eyes, while at the same time saying, I see what they're doing, right. and I refuse to participate, or I refuse to encourage or enable. If you can get there, you can actually help them because it's God's example that will, that will destroy them. And I mean this in the, in the right spiritual sense. When you come across an addict, and I have many, many times in my life, and you love them and you truly love them without reservation, without qualification, right. without, well, if you weren't doing cocaine, I would love you. If you love them and you truly love them, that is the most destructive thing to their to their addiction that they can possibly come up against because they have no weapon against that. They mm -hmm. cannot snort that away. Right. That image of you in love, in full acceptance and God's embrace is the most is the sword they can't defeat. That's the yeah. only one I found. Every one other one fails. Guilt, shame, yelling, screaming, right. uh, shunning. You can't yell someone's way out of addiction. You can't yell <clears throat> at them to wake up and just see the light. They have to get to that conclusion themselves. Well, I mean, empathetically, I mean, if they, first of all, if they wanted to quit, they would. Um, right. That might sound harsh, but that's always been my opinion. Like, yeah. I know when I'm eating a cookie, when I shouldn't be eating the cookie, you know what I mean? I'm choosing mm -hmm. to eat the cookie. It's, it's okay. I'm not right. killing anybody, but I'm choosing to eat the cookie, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, they're addicted. They, they have a chemical uh, problem that they either have to go through detox to get past or they have to serve the addiction. I appreciate you shedding some light and sharing some of your personal story and dealing with addiction. You know, we all will face loss in our lives at, at one point or another. And how we react to those times can radically define us, I think, for better or for worse. You know, my hope is that people who listen to you and, and your story and what you've experienced and witnessed will walk away with a renewed belief that like, hey, th this isn't how my story is going to end. Like a renewed belief in themselves that they can reinvent and choose a different path. You have to start with the assumption that you have a level of control that normally you don't believe you have. Mm. It's difficult in a world which is constantly telling you that the choices that you normally make are very powerful, like the app you choose or the, or the show you watch. Like That's some sort of powerful decision. There's no power in that at all. Right. The real power is I'm an individual. Even if you don't believe in God, you're one of one. And you have the option in life to live a life that's only yours. And that's the beautiful part about being a free person in a Western country. You can wear what you want, generally speaking. You can go where you want to go, generally speaking. Uh, you know, yeah, there are exclusions, but m most of life is pretty free. You can love who you love. You can, I mean, heck, you want to be in a, Three-way relationship. I mean, go for it. Be happy. Do whatever what makes you happy, especially, especially if it doesn't harm anyone else. Um, don't let somehow somebody convince you that you don't have that power. But as you take that power, yes, I want to be the person who has uh, green hair and is in a polyamorous relationship and da-da-da-da. If you want to be that person or you want to be a weirdo like me, then accept the responsibility that comes with it. Don't, yeah. don't be surprised when you get pushback from the world. Not because uh, the world's supposed to understand. The world's not going to understand. In fact, when they come across, usually when they come across a one of one, they push back because they don't get it because you don't fall into the normal category. So don't be surprised if you're the first person ever to walk on the moon that somebody's going to ask you a weird question or question your sense of uh, style or something. It just goes with the territory. You know, I mentioned the band Nirvana earlier. You know, as far as songwriting ability goes, you're in the most esteemed company, occupying the same space as people like Kurt Cobain. In speaking about Nirvana's front man, and I mention this because, you know, we're, we're talking about addiction and the highs and lows and everything that encompasses that. You said in a separate interview, quote, Kurt Cobain, as a lyricist, as a songwriter, as a visionary, was a fucking assassin. He was great at what he did, and it's a shame he didn't do more of it. 
I am curious, and I think my viewers and listeners out there would be curious to know, is there anything that Kurt Cobain ever told you during the time that he was alive that really stuck with you? Or did he ever give you a piece of advice? Or is there a funny story you have involving him? Our relationship was basically through Courtney. Um, uh, we both knew Courtney before they were married. And then Courtney and I continued to have a friendship when they were married. And um, of course, after he died, uh, I continued to have a relationship with Courtney, including working with Courtney on a professional level. So I think it was one of those situations where because of um, the nature of his personal relationship with Courtney and that Courtney and I had had a relationship before they were married, it was always a bit, a bit of that weird kind of, you know, the ex a love guy triangle, or if you will. Love triangle. No, I wouldn't say that. I, I look. They, they, they had a very uh, complicated and intense union, which produced a beautiful child in Francis. So uh, I'm, I'm not one to question karma or something like that. Those two were meant to kind of lock horns and do what they did, um, and uh, a lot of good things came out of it. So. Yeah, it was just more, I don't think he knew me personally. Like, it's not like we got to know each other and then we knew each other that way. We knew, we knew each other through Courtney. So that's always kind of a weird thing because you're like the friend of a friend. You're not right. the friend of the person. And I've never claimed to be a Kurt's friend. I don't think Kurt would have thought of himself as my friend. But we certainly had personal conversations, some, some of which I may share someday and some of which I may not. But I don't, I don't want to oversell it. There was no uh, intense relationship there. I, and I think uh, kindly put, you know, and I think it's worth uh, adding some context. Um, you know, we were, we were both chased in the same, you know, uh, flag at the top of the hill. Yeah. Uh, that was a, that was a mighty prize to get in the early nineties. You know, you know, people were throwing around words like voice of a generation and stuff like that. Well, you know, uh, I thought my voice was just as valuable and, you know, uh, kicking whoever was in my way out of my way, um, including, you know, uh, All right. Kurt and I everybody else was part of my game. Um, so it, it, I tend to think of it more in a kind of a friendly sports frame, you friendly know, which is fire. like you yeah. dunk on me, I dunk on you kind right. of stuff. So it was more of that kind of vibe. Like, you know, we were certainly aware of each other's abilities and, and there's only so much oxygen up, up there in the, in the stratosphere, particularly at that time, <laughs> which was a very heady time. And we were in the prime of our youth. I mean, it's not like you have a manual you know, one day you're a misanthrope in high school that everybody's picking on the next year on MTV every five minutes. It's a strange journey that only a few people take. So on one hand, you have a sense of camaraderie because you go, yeah, only a few people really know this gig we're in. And then on the other hand, it's like, yeah, but you're in the way and I'm in your way. And, and then there was the personal level. So I think that sort of maps it out simply, but yeah, I don't want to overstate. There was really, there was really not a lot there other than sort of an understanding. Interesting. You know, it's funny in conversation with you last night, I said, don't you want to know what my favorite Smashing Pumpkins song is? <laughs> and you said, you normally don't ask fans that question. And for good reason, I totally get that. You got to sort of keep the mystery and intrigue alive. But when I answered that mayonnaise was my favorite song, you said, oh, that's everybody's favorite song. And I I don't know. I truly thought that I was the only person. I guess I've just been living under a rock all of these years. Why do you think so many people love and identify with that particular song? Well, <clears throat> I'll give you the I'll give you the public answer and then I'll give you the honest answer. Okay. All right. I'll take it. The public answer is it's a great song. And it is a great <laughs> song. It's one of the best songs we've ever done. Um, and uh, it was it started from a, a an idea that James had, a beautiful idea. And I picked it up and ran with it and wrote the song around it. Um, and that's probably one of the best things that he and I did together. Um, did you really call it mayonnaise because you opened your fridge and there was just something you, it was the first thing no. you saw? No, I'll tell you that story in a second, but let me okay. tell you my, my, the true answer. See, every band has those songs where if you're really a fan, you find those songs that the public doesn't know. But if you're a fan, you know that song. So mayonnaise is one of those songs. Like, it wasn't a hit, but if you're a fan, you go, oh, mayonnaise, that's one of the, that's oh, one of good. the good okay. ones. Okay, so I earned my fan credential then, right? To a, to a degree. <laughs> but see, there's, this is where it gets complicated and, and where you might want to back off, up, off that statement. Um, the other night I was in a casino after our gig. Uh, we played at this big casino that has a big arena there. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm playing blackjack and, and this guy comes up over my shoulder, obviously a fan, and he goes, why do you guys play mayonnaise tonight? 
And I turned around and said, are you going to be that guy? Oh, and he goes, man. well, I don't care. But my two friends sent me over here and said that if I told you that, you would probably get irritated. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so you can tell them to go, you know, wet themselves. And the guy <laughs> slunk away. Oh, See, man. So I'm like the drunk guy in the casino now. No, Play you're manners. not the drunk guy in the casino. What it is, is um, certain fans, not all fans, like to take a certain possession of a band. And it's their version of the band is, is better than your version of the band. Okay. So mayonnaise becomes one of those songs of like, uh, you know, in my version of this, I'm pretending I'm a fan. In my version of the Smashing Pumpkins, they would play mayonnaise at every gig because it's one of the best. Songs. In fact, it's their best song. And the fact that Billy doesn't play it has everything to do with the fact that he wrote it with James and he doesn't want to play it because he wrote it with James. That's why they don't play mayonnaise. Mm. You know, that's that. The, yeah. So they think they're in some sort of inner lane on psych. Okay. Band right. pumpkin psychology. I feel like this is so something you would see on Reddit. Like just you yes. know, it's yeah. a Reddit. It's a Reddit mixed <laughs> with hipster fan culture. Because fans like to think that they know Bob Dylan better than Bob Dylan right. or Billy than right. better than Billy. Yeah. Um. And and I of course you know I'm very in touch with how we run our world on a business level. So I get reports back and what people talk about. Um. You know I'm not down in the message boards, but I hear about things. So. Mayonnaise over time has become one of those songs where fans sort of show like an authority or hegemonic, like I know the band better than you. And if you don't know mayonnaise, well, you're not really a fan. So you stumbled right into the hipster band argument. Oh, man. Quite innocently. I did. It was very innocent. Listen, I love all of your songs. And I know that's cheesy. And I'm sure you hear that all the time, too. Uh, but l you, listen, don't, it's don't skip past your question, though. You want to know where the title mayonnaise came I from? I do. Okay. And when I, hold on, but when I Googled it, because I am a, a, a recovering reporter after all, I, do, I did my research. The first thing that pops up on Google is, oh, Billy saw a tub of may mayo in the fridge. It was the first thing he saw. So he's like, oh, we'll call it mayonnaise. Like, what? Is that true? That's the lie that we told people. Okay. We used to lie all the time on purpose to journalists. That's that's hysterical, by because, the way. Because uh, I know this may shock you, but we had no respect for journalists. So no, no, me I, I get messing, that. Messing nope. messing with journalists became a part time vocation for the no Smashing offense, Pumpkins. No offense, we would taken. All, and we would all do it together, and you could tell, like we knew when somebody else was ribbing on the journalists. Yeah, so yeah, then yeah. the other band members would join in with the bullshit. Do we get to know the real story? The real story. Um, we went to Japan in 1992, uh, for our first trip there. And we met a very nice man who worked for the record label. And in Japan, they do this, uh, extra booklet type of thing where they translate the lyrics for Japanese fans. There was no lyric sheet for Gish. So the young man had listened to the album on headphones. And so in the book that was his English interpretation of the lyrics, which mostly were incorrect. And then he had translated those into Japanese for the Japanese fans. So it was like a double um, right. uh, problem. Okay. So we're sitting there in between, you know, some interview and we're looking at the lyrics and we come across one of the lyrics and uh, he had written a lyric. I, I can't remember which song it was for, but he had changed one of my lyrics to mayonnaise seas. Mayonnaise seas. Okay. Yeah. Like a sea of mayonnaise. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he had, you know, he had earnestly visual. thought he heard me say, man, people have complained through the years about my poor diction and singing. So somehow he had heard something mayonnaise sees. And we just thought it was the funniest thing we ever heard. That is Because a sea of mayonnaise is like, you know, it's both, you can go sexual with it. You can go like, what? There's a lot what? of different ways you can go with it. Yeah. 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 Sea of mayonnaise, right? So somehow that this the idea of something with mayonnaise and a song and lyrics sort of stuck somewhere in the ether of the band. So one day in rehearsal, you know, you get the invariable, what are we going to call this thing? And I was like, <laughs> well, just call it mayonnaise because it's so <laughs> stupid. And with the idea that we would change the title, but somehow mayonnaise just kind of stuck. Right. Which is kind of funny to me now looking back because it might have something to do with the fact that the song's not better known because if you called the song, uh, you know, I just want to beat me or something. It might have been a bigger song. Man, it was, was probably a bit of a weird uh, jump to figure out that that song was called Mayonnaise. 
I love that I heard this story. Now you're not bullshitting me, right? Because I am, even though I was with the press for many, many, many years, just want to make sure that that story is verified a hundred percent. That's the, the, that's a, that's the fact check. True. Fact check. Fact check. Okay, good. All right. Well, I know we focus the majority of this episode on your music, but I feel like I'd be remiss not to ask you anything about the national wrestling Alliance of which you purchased in 2017. Billy, when that happened, naysayers came at you asking, like, what could you possibly do with a property that had fallen into relative obscurity after 70 years in existence? With competitors like the WWE and AEW, I am curious, how has the w- NWA found its voice in the wrestling ecosystem? Simply, I I went to the same sort of playbook I went to with the pumpkins, which is if you don't have a lot of resources, i.e. money to blow, um, then you have to build something which has a unique culture, which will attract people. And then in attracting those people who tend to be a little bit more intelligent, they will become uh, uh, proselytes for what you're actually trying to uh, create. Um, So you have to sort of understand alternative culture or subculture maybe is a better way to put it. Um, You have to understand why somebody would be willing to watch a $4 million horror movie as opposed to a $400 million horror movie. The $4 million horror movie obviously won't have the special effects as the $400 million one, and they won't have the big actors, but it might have a vibe or something cool about it that you would tell your friends about. So you start there, you have to create something that's sort of worth talking about or worth sharing. And um, and then you have to navigate people's expectations First, people thought because it was me, I was going to come in and blow a tremendous amount of money. And when I didn't, they basically said, well, this isn't going to go anywhere. Then when they didn't understand what I was doing, um, they sort of said, oh, it's cool, but it's it's never going to go anywhere because it's sort of it's relegated to this kind of historical kind of throwback vibe. And so over time, I've had to build the culture up both internally with the talent and then externally with uh, people who are interested in wrestling on a day to day level that I do have a vision. I do have a plan. And in executing that plan, now I'm starting to get kind of uh, people starting to take it seriously because they realized that I wasn't playing around from the beginning. And, and a lot of the early assumptions were incorrect, which very similar to the pumpkins, very similar experience. Oh, I love that. I love proving the naysayers wrong. Just lights a fire underneath me. We're going to wrap this up with something, a question that I like asking people like you, um, not dating you here, but you know, you have been around for a minute or two. You're so wise and you've accomplished so much in your career. Billy, in looking back, I am curious, what would Billy Corgan today tell Billy Corgan when he was in his 20s? I would tell myself not to listen to anybody. I would just do whatever I thought was right. Because overall, that was a better stratagem than listening to others and trying to integrate their advice into what I was doing. It doesn't mean I was was never wrong. I was wrong a lot, but I was less wrong than they were wrong. Most people's advice is based on fear. Mm, you know, hey, I see a wall coming. You might want to turn left. That's most people's advice. And then when you kind of question, I'm just trying to protect you. Right. Protect you from what? You know, outside of death, which is worth being protected from, most of the conundrums in life and particularly in business life are psychological. Mm. The worst people to deal with in the world are people who have an overflated sense of value. Yes. Agreed. Right. Because well, and they surround themselves with like yes men, you know, who always tell them, Sure. You're so great. Oh my gosh. Sure. Yeah. If you if you know your sense of value and you go into the world and say, Okay, you know, I'm and I don't want to be unfair to anybody, but I, I was pretty honest with myself. Like it wasn't like I was a, a beauty pageant winner and I was going to get on the cover of a magazine because people like my winsome smile. You know, I was never that person. So it wasn't like I thought that that was going to be an advantage for, as to give an example. But I did think I was a talented musician. So when I assessed my value against others, I thought I had an honest opportunity to succeed. I entered into a system and I was quickly told that what I had to offer didn't have value and I might as well go get a day job. Okay, that became the critical juncture of which I had to start making decisions about whether I was going to double down, triple down on my vision, or I was going to go work at a bookstore. That's when the people start coming in going, you know, you probably should change the name. Uh, your hair is too long. Your voice is too weird. Maybe get another lead singer. My father gave me that advice. He said, you're a great guitar player and you're a good songwriter, but you can't sing. Get another singer or you'll never wow. succeed. Wow. 
Wow. And he was a professional singer, by the way. It wasn't wow. like he was just a guitar player. So him saying, I can't sing, uh, was sort of certainly injurious, but I ignored him. Yeah, I get it. And we wouldn't it. be talking all these years later about mayonnaise if I listened huh? to my father. <laughs> and you also wouldn't be a two-time Grammy Award winning absolute alternative rock legend today. Okay, so I can't let you leave. I'm sorry just yet. Uh, we're going to do something epic to wrap up this episode. I haven't done this in a hot minute with a guest, but I feel like you're the perfect person to do this with. So uh, we're going to do a fun rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready, Billy? Born. <laughs> I don't know. Strap in. All right. Ready? Which do you prefer, texting or talking on the phone? Talking on the phone. Oh, okay. Uh, cats or dogs? Cats. Wow. That's going to piss off a lot of my viewers and listeners. But and, a you're, French, and a French bulldog. And a French bulldog you have. But you're speaking the language of my heart because I'm the crazy cat lady. Uh, favorite holiday? Christmas. Christmas. Okay. First celebrity crush? Ooh. I know you have a lot of crushes, so, you know. Nadia Comaneci. Who's that? Who's that? Nadia right. Comaneci was the first athlete to ever get a perfect 10 at the Olympics. Oh, wow. Romanian okay. gymnast, 1976 Olympics in Montreal, I believe. Romania. And it was one of the great pleasures of my life. I once got asked to do a telethon, and uh, Nadia and her husband, Bart Connor, were co-hosts, and I got to host with them. Wow. And so, and I even got an autographed picture from her. Um, one of my uh, friends had act, was actually at the Olympics and had taken photos that she had never seen of her performing uh, like a floor routine or something. Right. So I was able to give her one of the pictures from the photographer and then she signed another for me. So very that, was cool. my first, that was my first celebrity crush. Wow. Very cool. Uh, do you snore? No, I do not. In fact, are you sure? Um, do we need to bring not, someone not to, in to verify? Not to slow down. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Not to slow down the rapid fire round here, but this is very important to me. <laughs> Um, it has become a thing with partners through the years. I've been with the same partner for over 10 years, uh, but it's become a thing with multiple partners through the years. Uh, they're irritated that I do not snore. Okay. Because irritated. they do. Oh. And I don't. And so invariably, if you say to your partner, hey, you were snoring or hey, yeah. stop, you know, I can't sleep because you're snoring. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry. They try Did to, you just they try to your... catch... They try, just, say, they try to say you snore too. And I'm like, I know I don't snore and you'll never catch me snoring. And they literally can't catch me snoring. They'll but, stand there with a cell phone and wait. I did you snore. just throw your partner, Chloe Mandel, under the bus that, saying that she snores on a podcast? Is that I don't think it's unusual that, that all people snore. Uh, <laughs> in, in my experience, men tend to snore more than ladies. But I have been around a few beautiful women who occasionally uh, particularly after a couple glasses of wine and a, a chocolate bar in their hand, uh, might snore a little bit. Um, and where you would just sort of gently say, "Hey, you know, can, can you stop the? Uh, can you stop taking down the sequoia forest uh, over there?" So I get some sleep. Oh my gosh, you're so funny. I love it. Well, hey, now the world, ladies and gentlemen, knows that Billy Corgan does not snore. Interesting. Uh, what's your death row meal? My death row meal? Yeah, if you're on death row so and you had a last meal, what would your meal be? See, this is why I'm superstitious. I don't answer those questions. Oh, okay. But I'm, you're a vegan, so, but I feel like, would you, you probably wouldn't eat vegan, I would, I would think. Or would you? Maybe you would. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I refuse not to answer, answer. this question. Okay. I'm, I'm going right. with the fifth here. Okay, plead the fifth. Uh, say a word in Spanish. Um, See. Si. See, okay, that was, an, that, was, that was an easy one. That was a throwaway. All right, if you could be stuck in an elevator with one person from history, who would it be? My heart says Jimi Hendrix, but I probably have to go with Jesus because <laughs> I'd probably get more out of the conversation, but Jimmy would come close. <laughs> I like that. You put Jimi Hendrix and Jesus on the same. I, I like it. I like it. All right, so was Rose selfish for not letting Jack on the door from the movie Titanic. I've never seen the movie Titanic. That's going to, do you realize that's going to be breaking news? Like Billy Corgan has not seen the movie Titanic. That's going to be what, you know, in the headlines. When everyone wants to go see a movie and says, you must see this movie. That's exactly the reason <laughs> I won't see the movie because oh, if everybody's into it, I know I'm going to hate the movie. Such the contrarian. I love it. So funny. All right. Every time I play the song rocket, 
from your iconic 1993 album Siamese Dream in my car. Does an angel get its wings? Yes or no? No. Why? Why is that? It's not so simple. Okay. All right. It's a great song though. Um, all right. Chicago. Okay. This is the last one and it's a biggie. All right. Chicago deep dish or New York pizza. Chicago deep dish all day long. Eh, In fact, I, eh, hold on. Wrong answer. Hold on. I didn't know you were the judge. <laughs> I didn't know I was dealing with judge Jen today. <laughs> judge Jen, uh, please, uh, sidebar, please. Uh, gavel, but full disclosure. Now let's, let's get granular here. If people have made it this far into your into your uh, podcast, uh, let's get granular here. Okay. Okay. First of all, New York pizza, unbelievably overrated. Unbelievably oh overrated. Oh my it is one of the strangest and probably <sighs> biggest chinks in the New York armor that they love their pizza the way they do. It is so not this. even in the Chicago I'm have league. To cut your audio at some point. You, you do whatever you have to do, but I'm I'm going to speak until you cut me off. <laughs> Like New York pizza, not even in Chicago's league, mm. not even close. Mm. When we first went to New York, everybody was like, yo, you got to try New York pizza. So the whole band goes to try New York pizza. Four to zero, the, uh, the Smashing Pumpkins were like, get the, you know what, out of, with the New York accent, get out of here. Right. Not even close. Not even close. Yeah. No, not so you want to know. Wait, wait. Okay. All right. Wait, I have to have my, my moment, though, to, oh, to you'll contribute get your, to this argument. This is, okay. this is your podcast. You'll get the last word, whether I want you to <laughs> oh, or not. thanks. <laughs> Let me finish my soliloquy here. Secondarily, I used to work for a place called Nancy's Pizza, which in its day in the 80s was a rival to some of the best deep dish pizza places in Chicago. I was a delivery guy. So you're talking to somebody who ate a lot of deep dish pizza before I was a vegan. Mm. So if you want to, okay, so straight up normal pizza, Chicago versus New York, Chicago, it's like Michael Jordan against a forgotten NBA name. Okay. Not even close. Now you want to go deep dish. It's like Godzilla versus an ant. Not even close, what? not no. even close. Gosh. The fact that you've even asked this question sort of uh, undermines your credibility as a, as a, as a journalist, if you still oh, want to call yourself man. a journalist. Oh, Oh, this is like taking a dagger to the heart. And Billy Corgan, my all, one of my all-time musical heroes, just told Wait, me. Remember what I said about love? You still have to love me even though I'm disappointing you. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. I take my pizza pride very seriously. You know, it's funny. You know what we call pizza here in New York? Pizza. Like you guys call it Chicago deep dish. It, that's not pizza. It's a casserole. It's not real pizza. It's a bread bowl. It's a bread bowl with tomato, with uncooked Wait, marinara. What is the name of this podcast? Reinvented? Yeah. Chicago Reinvented Pizza. Oh, gosh. Okay. Now you you're to, weaponizing you need, my theme against me. You need to check yourself there. <laughs> oh, man. It's a casserole. You can't convince me otherwise. If you haven't seen Jon Stewart, by the way, he if, does wait, this. If, Chic if Chicago Deep Dish Pizza is a casserole, okay, mm -hmm. your standard New York pizza is an oil barrel. Mm. Yeah. No, no, I don't know. I think Chicago deep dish is like an underground sewer for rats. I think it's like when I, you know, at the, at the end of a long night after a night of like partying or going to a concert, I want to know when I bite into my pizza, I'm not going to drown in it. You know, like that's what John Stewart says. He's like, I, I want to know I'm not going to drown in it. Because it's like a swimming pool. Are you honestly citing Jon Stewart as an authoritative source on anything? <laughs> He's a diehard besides New Yorker. Snark, be, be, He's besides a die snark. Listen, there's a few things that we take seriously in New York City, um, two of which, you know, bagels and pizza. And I will, I will fight that fight See, till my dying breath. I will breath. be fair here. The New York bagel is better than the Chicago bagel. Okay, so okay. we're even. All right, you threw me, you threw me a bone there. See, I'm, 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 I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> the the like New York that. bagel is the supreme bagel. Okay. No, it's not even, not even close. Not, not even, even close. close. All right. Well, Billy Corgan, you, my friend, are a legend. You are the mastermind behind the Smashing Pumpkins, and undoubtedly, I will say, one of Chicago's best products. I mean, your pizza sucks, but we'll let that one slide. No comment. <laughs> Billy, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Reinvented. Seriously. I know you're on tour right now. You are coming to us 
from Boston currently. So thank you for, for coming on the show. Your pizza sucks. But again, thanks for before, coming on. Before I say goodbye, and thank you to anybody who's listened, okay? I want everyone to know I own a vegan tea house. So she's actually sort of picked a fight with me over a food <laughs> I don't even eat anymore. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> to all my viewers and listeners, if you haven't checked out Billy's new podcast, 33, check it out. You won't regret it. The Smashing Pumpkins are also currently on tour with Jane's Addiction for the Spirits on Fire tour. And we'll also be playing here in New York City at Madison Square Garden next week. I can't wait for that show. And I'm going to bring pizza to the show just for spite. As for this show, be sure to rate, review and subscribe to Reinvented. That's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, iHeartRadio, YouTube. You name it, it's there. I'm Jen Eckhart. That was Billy Corgan. Thank you for listening.